executing its malicious payload. Sure. With DEP, you can uh, any any heap and stack that might have code placed into it. The second the service tries to go and execute that code, when it's tricked to by the virus, it's going to blow up, and so the virus isn't going to get going to get very far. But there are cases where virus might be able to get into a service through other mechanisms that aren't caught by DEP. Mm -hmm. And once it's inside, once it's made its way in, infected the service, then the first thing it wants to do is start to call operating system services. Like, hey, I want to drop myself onto the, into the file system so that I'm there the next time the system boots. Mm -hmm. And to do that, it needs to know where, which, at which address these functions reside. Virus writers have had it pretty easy up until Windows Vista because on Windows XP, for example, uh, if there's a function in the kernel in kernel 32.dll, this one of the core system DLLs, mm -hmm. like create file, that's always going to be at a specific address, and so they can just write and they run their, writing their virus say, well, I know that I can call address 0x7 blah blah blah, and ah. that's going to be create file. Okay. Because there's no uh, when when they get in on the machine, they can't call a function that says, tell me where create file is located, because they'd have to know where that function's located. They, sure. They get proc address function, for example, okay. which is what you, they'd have to call for that. But on Windows Vista, because of ASLR, kernel 32 never loads in the same place every time the system boots. Excellent. And so, so now they they don't know where, where so create is file it a, is. So, you know, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we haven't really covered that very much, John. Uh -huh. I mean, Jim Alchin, in the interview we did, he mentioned it very briefly. But it was Jim Altrin. You know, he's not an architect, he's not an engineer, uh -huh. but he is a computer scientist. So, he, you know, shouldn't give actually give him more props than that. Yeah, and he's, he's also an amazing guy. he was a big champion for getting into the system. So I don't know why I said that. Yeah. So excuse me, Jim. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I didn't mean any disrespect. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. So it, the algorithm is probably going to be pretty complicated, pretty nonlinear. It's got to be random. Yeah, it's actually not that complicated. And really? I, yeah, and I mentioned I, I describe it in a kind of basic level in uh, uh, the third part of my Windows Vista kernel changes Excellent. article. It's called, it's inside the Windows Vista kernel. I've, I've, I've looked it's, through it. Yeah, in TechNet Magazine. Excellent. Um, February, March, and April issues. Cool. So that's in the, the April issue, which is not going to, it's not out yet. Okay. But uh, I talk about basically how ASLR works and it work. It does uh, randomization of the executable itself, so the exe is never in the same place. Every time you run Notepad or any Windows Vista component, because yeah. all Windows Vista components are compiled with this flag that says to the system, "You can move me around." Excellent. Uh, so anytime you run a executable, Windows Vista executable, the memory manager goes and picks from one of 256 locations in this range near where the executables says that it likes to, it, it likes to start. Yeah and places it someplace randomly in there. And then the same thing happens for DLLs. The first DLL it loads in the process, it puts it in a certain place, one of 256 locations mm -hmm. that are near where the DLL wanted to launch, and then it places other DLLs close to, close to that one to pack, pack them together so they don't get all spread out all over the place, which it would, would happen mm -hmm. if it did each one randomly. So, and this of course has no implications for any sort of attached process like a debugger? No, nope, the debugger, all that information about where things are loaded is obtained dynamically by the debugger, so okay. it, it's not making assumptions about where things reside. Either. Sure, so the memory yeah. manager takes care of, yeah. of where things... Yeah, that, it's to basically totally transparent. That's awesome. Yeah. The That's only, pretty amazing. Yeah, it is It is really cool, but uh, the, the shame is that it can't go and do this to everything. It, it does it only to images that have this special flag in it that developers have to place in Why? the image. Why? Why is that? And that's because there's cases where code, for some reason, has some kind of subtle dependency on where, well, it's usually subtle, but it can be explicit about where it loads into memory. And so the developers, you know, hmm. addressing, uh, because it loads in memory in this place, this other thing is in a certain place, this buffer's in a certain place. Interesting. And there might be a bug in the program where it goes over the end of a buffer. Okay. And if it loads in a certain place in memory, that is hidden from the program. It's a kind of a silent bug and the app seems to work. But if it loads someplace else, that then that triggers the bug shows up in some visible way. 
Now, you know, it sounds to me like is it could this now is that the same? Is that true in X sixty four world, or do we require um, in X sixty four world? Do it all? Yeah, yeah, it's true in X sixty four world too. Okay, uh, that those guys have to be put a flag. This way. Yeah, that's interesting. Could it be done automatically? Or is a flag required so that the memory manager? I mean, could it, could it be done automatically? Yeah, it could be done without automatic. a flag. We, yeah, it could be done without a flag. But okay. then we'd have cases where pro people's programs would crash uh, <laughs> on Vista, where they didn't crash on XP, or oh, because they weren't right, written correctly. Yeah, because they weren't okay, or, or or yeah, because they were written with some kind of explicit or implicit dependency on where they're loading into memory. So yeah, that's interesting. So what else? What I mean, what, let, let's talk. About, I mean, that's that's yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. So, so you now you get the combination of ASLR and DEP, and that makes it even harder for viruses to get in. And then you talk to Scott Field about yeah. service security hardening, Absolutely. which one of the most uh, one of the way, uh, the most common way that a system exposes itself to the network is through services, and which are running all the time, have ports open so that other machines can talk to the service, yep. and. Now, when you have service security hardening that Scott talked about, plus ASLR and DEP, mm -hmm. now you've hardened that entryway that now we're usually take, tries to take advantage of. If you look at the network propagating worms like SQL Slammer and yeah. the DCOM vulnerability and uh, IS indexing vulnerability that uh, Code Red took advantage of, all of those kinds of things are blocked with these techniques. Excellent. And just, just so people who are watching this, because the Scott Field interview, you know, find it on channel 9 it's not that hard my friends yes yeah. uh, but I provide a link on, in, in this blur but it's basically stating that services run at lowest pri at the lowest privilege yeah. right and yeah. they can't do things that would require system access without elevating in which case we would be informed yeah. as users yeah. that something strange is going on yeah right yeah so the, yeah fundamentally it's in Windows XP there were three service security accounts, local service, network service, and local system. Mm -hmm. On Windows Vista, it and so services on Windows Vista still run in one of those three accounts. Sure. But each service has different requirements about what privileges and what access access to what objects it needs. So what Windows Vista and Service Security Hardening does is let's take uh, things that run in local service and split them into things that run in local service but need these privileges and the access to these kinds of things. and. Cool. Ones that need different set of privileges, and we'll separate those. And now there's different, basically, degrees of each of those accounts now in Windows Vista. Cool. Kind of dynamically generated. So now I've read your blog, uh -huh. and it, which is it's a good blog for Thanks. sure. Um, and I recently had written about uh, trying to clear the confusion between security boundaries. Uh, and gatekeeper technologies like UAC, mm -hmm. which basically just throws up UI and says, hey, you know, some boundaries trying to cross into, trying to do something that requires elevated privileges, do you want to let it do it? It's more complicated than that, but UAC really isn't super complex, as we illustrated in a video that we released recently mm -hmm. with John Schwartz. I mean, right. They didn't write a ton of code. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, I guess I was going somewhere with that, yes. Uh, you had, written this article talking about the differences. I mean, someone had, I can't remember the name, a hacker or, not a hacker, but a security researcher from uh, Eastern Europe has uh -huh. stated that there's a glaring, terrible security vulnerability in the whole UAC model. You know, it, in, installers can run as admin, right? So you didn't write a post necessarily to confront that. You just happened to post something out yeah. at a similar time. but. Let's talk about, like, just let's clear up what she said and what you're talking about and try to develop some sort of understanding here. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, basically, what she said, like you pointed out, was mm -hmm. there's a, a security vulnerability because sys installer, there's installer detection built into Windows Vista. Okay. Where, I don't know if you, I didn't haven't seen the John uh, Schwartz interview, so I don't know how deeply he got into these kinds of things, but yeah. the installer detection functionality basically looks at the file name and uses some heuristics like does it have setup, install, or update in the name, and <laughs> if so, I'm gonna s and it doesn't have a, a manifest, a marker that mm -hmm. indicates that the developer wrote this for Windows Vista or wrote it for per user install, mm -hmm. I'm going to assume that this thing needs to access system or admin rights mm -hmm. to be able to create a directory under program files, for example, which you can't do as a standard user. Okay. And she viewed this as a 
the installer detection as a security problem? Why does it automatically assume that all of these things are require admin rights? And if you talk to John and the team that 